Hey everyone, Steve here again with another random video. In this video, I'm repairing a Mega Man Zero Game Boy Advance cartridge. I picked this up a while ago on eBay for $15 and was described as not working with the Nintendo logo appearing garbled on the screen and the game not loading. I checked this out by trying the cartridge on my Game Boy Advance and found the description to be true. I took apart the cartridge shell to expose the PCB but didn't find any damage on either the shell or the front of the PCB. On the back though, that was a different story. It appeared there was corrosion on different areas of the back of the board. To check that the damage wasn't superficial, I wanted to do my normal check of cleaning the cartridge pins with an eraser, isopropyl alcohol, and a cotton swab. Unfortunately, this did not remedy the problem after reinserting the cartridge, so this was going to be a challenge. As of this video, this was the most work I ever put into a cartridge and is reflected by the length. Here, I'll show the process on how I diagnosed the issues on the PCB and my attempt at a repair. Before continuing, at the end of the video, please like or dislike it. If this video or any of my other videos brought you value or entertainment, consider subscribing for more. Thank you, and with that out of the way, let's get back to the video. Since I had my work cut out for me, the least I could do was take my multimeter, place it in continuity mode, and check every trace on the back of the board. This was a time consuming process because it was basically a small connect the dots game. To help keep track of what I was doing, I took a photo of the back of the PCB and drew on top of the traces with a paint program to help keep track of faulty traces. After a amount of time and eye strain, I eventually found some traces that didn't work properly. It was six traces that were broken in different places. So far, these will need to be repaired to make this cartridge work again. So, I got to work by picking a trace and started scraping where there were possible signs of corrosion. I also tried to scrape any debris in the connecting vias or the small holes between the traces as well, but I can only do so much with a hobbyist knife. Whenever I thought I got all the corrosion, I would pull out my multimeter to see if the area I scraped had a break in the trace by checking along the exposed copper. I would scrape more masking off the trace if I didn't find a break. I eventually found the break but there was a second one along the same trace after running my multimeter between vias. I scraped some masking off and ran my multimeter again to find the location of the other break. When I confirmed the second break, I grabbed some flux and applied it to the two exposed parts of the trace. I applied some solder to tin the traces before applying jumpers. One end of the jumper was applied next and it was easy to apply when the trace was tinned. I shaped it with some tweezers before securing the rest of the jumper with my iron. After cleaning with a cotton swab and alcohol, I applied the same technique to the other jumper on the trace and tested that the trace worked again. I moved on to another trace and unfortunately it only got harder from here. I scraped up the portion of the trace that had some noticeable corrosion and tested it afterwards but found that the trace also had a second break in it between two of the vias. I scraped back more of the trace where there was a second break and thought that when applying the jumper I could just solder directly to the via. I prepped the trace with flux and was getting ready to tin the trace when I found that none of my solder was sticking to the via. This was troubling because if I couldn't apply solder to this via, that would mean there's corrosion inside that hole and blocking electrical signals between the front and back of the board. I even tried using a soldering tip specifically made for small vias like this and the solder still wouldn't stick. I had to think about my plan to tackle this trace so I skipped that portion of the trace for now. I applied the jumper to the other part of the trace and that went a lot smoother.
Moving on to another trace, I did my normal technique of scraping up anything that looked like corrosion, and there was a noticeable sign of it on two parallel traces. Unfortunately, after testing with probes, that wasn't where the break was located on the trace I was working on at the time. After testing the trace again, I eventually found the break lower on the board and applied a jumper to fix it. I moved on to the trace above the previous one I was working on since they both shared corrosion in the same place. I would have to come back to this trace again because the next trace above it was so close to this one that my soldering iron would bump into the newly applied jumper, but I wanted to show how I initially got the jumper on there. For the next trace above the previous one, I had multiple issues. For one, the break in this trace ran through two vias, so I'd have to join two jumpers together. What made it worse was neither via was taking solder like the second trace from earlier. If I couldn't apply a jumper directly onto this trace, I would have to run two jumpers to the other side of the board and figure out where they go to. The problem there, though, is the two vias that go to the opposite side of the board are blocked by one of the bigger chips that run the game. If I want to fix these traces, I would have to remove the chip temporarily and reapply it when done with a fix. Luckily for me, I came into possession of a hot air station that would help me with removing a bigger chip like this. Before applying any heat, I covered up my current work on the back with captain tape just in case of excessive heat. I set my station at 500 degrees Fahrenheit with 65% airflow and applied heat evenly to both sides of the chip. When I was finally able to remove the chip safely, I put it to the side and cleaned up the part of the board that was covered by the chip. Off camera, I ran two wires through the vias that were causing issues. With one of them, I removed the coating off the wire and soldered directly to the via. This time the solder stuck to the hole. When I was satisfied with that wire, I applied the same steps to the other one. When both wires were applied, I flipped the board over to attach the other ends to their respective trace. This one was tricky because after applying one jumper to the trace, I'd have to make sure the other jumper was soldered to the first one to make good contact.
I moved on to the last trace needing repair on the back of the board. Luckily, it was a simpler fix compared to the previous trace. Off camera, I cleaned off my traces, reflowed some solder on some jumpers to make them look decent, and fixed the jumper that got knocked off previously. It's come a long way, but the work isn't over. I applied some captain tape to the back again and turned my attention to the front. Before placing the chip back onto the board, I used my multimeter to check the traces hidden under the chip. I was able to find two that didn't produce continuity, with one of the traces on the same line as the one I just fixed with the two jumpers. So, I got to work on both. I'm omitting some of the footage for time because both traces were so close to one another that I would accidentally move one when I applied the second jumper. When I finished those two up, I placed a small piece of captain tape over those two jumpers since I didn't want them to move when I reapplied the chip. Since that work was done, I applied some new solder to the pads that held the chip. When I was getting ready to seat the chip with the hot air station, I thought I could get away with heating the top and bomb pins with my iron to make the chip stay in place. I learned that was a no-go with the chip getting lopsided. I reversed that and went back to heating up the area and positioning it with my tweezers. To make sure the chip lakes were secure, I ran my iron over both sides. I turned my attention back to the second trace I skipped on earlier. While holding the PCB awkwardly and using my multimeter, 
I was able to find the via on the front of the board that connected with this trace. I took a longer piece of jumper, applied it, and ran to the front. I guesstimated how long the jumper should be, cut it, tin the opposite end, and apply it to the via on the front. For the moment of truth, I placed the PCB in its shell, sealed it, and tried it in my GBA. This was the first time I was ever relieved to see a Capcom logo on a screen. The game appeared to be working with no issues on startup, and gameplay worked as well. Two things I fixed off camera to cut video time, making a new jumper that crosses from the back to the front through a small hole in the PCB since it affected how the PCB sits in the cartridge. The other was giving the cartridge a new battery and was probably the simplest repair of the whole project. I placed captain tape on the areas that I worked on and closed the cartridge up for hopefully the final time. Hopefully everyone watching got something from this repair. I'm by no means an expert and learned by watching others on YouTube. If I can put the time and effort into diagnosing a small board like this, then everyone else can do the same. I think it paid off as another game gets a second chance at life. So, that'll do it for me in this video. This is Steve signing off, and stay safe everyone.